Our keynote is no stranger to uncertainty. In both her personal career and leadership roles, she has become accustomed to change, leaning in and learning not only how to adapt, but also how to thrive. Kicking off our day one keynote, please join me in welcoming Circle CI's VP of Product Engineering, Lena Reinhardt, who will provide her insights on showing up as a leader in times of change. Thank you so much for having me and welcome to day one. So I'm here to share with you today things that I've learned about navigating change from career changes, role transitions, and building and leading teams through crises, as well as hyper growth environments. But before we dig into all that, let's just start by talking about time. Today is Tuesday, March 276th in 2020. If you're looking for that information up to date in the future, look no further than ismarchoveryet.com. I'm not sure if March will ever end. And since this has been, it's been a quite a long month for all of us already, I want to actually travel back in time to the beginning of March. Where were you on March 1st, 2020? It was a Sunday. I personally had a bit of a cold. I went to bed at 11.30 the night before and woke up at 6 a.m. after a night of solid 96% quality sleep. I had already put my outfit together. I got ready to take a taxi to the airport. I was going to San Francisco to have meetings with my team and an offsite. And as I was just about to leave, I took my phone out of flight mode and saw a text message from Rob, my boss. Hey, Lena, trying all channels, don't fly. So I took off my shoes, canceled the taxi, opened my work laptop and canceled my flights and spent the day in the park with a few friends. Two days later, on Tuesday at 6.42 p.m., our CEO sent an email to the entire company with promotion announcements, and one of them was for me. After nine months as interim vice president, I took on the role for formerly. And in the same week, Berlin moved into lockdown. More countries and cities globally moved into lockdowns as well, and we had to cancel our annual department meeting. Also in the same week, I deleted an email draft. I had drafted an email to my organization and I obviously write all my emails in the dark with a fountain pen. It's very important to my process. And in this email, I was going to introduce myself formally, my strategy, direction for involving the organization, vision and those kinds of things. But then everything moved into pandemic mode and I had to first make sure that my organization was prepared for what was ahead of us. I'm sure everyone who's here today has a story like that about 2020. You made plans only to see them evaporate in front of your eyes. This year has been a year of great personal and professional difficulties and great hardship for many, many people. And I don't want to talk today about the email that I ended up sending to my organization a couple of weeks later, but about the things that I've thought about that I've learned from change and how to lead organizations through change. A human core need is choice. We want to have control and autonomy over important parts of our work, and we want to be able to make decisions about things that matter to us. But in times like these, what we can control in our environments and lives becomes limited, and one of our core needs is threatened, leading to increasing unease and stress. So change is big for us, and fundamentally, at a neurological level, very scary. And at a neurological level, the ambiguity that change comes with is also scary for us. Ambiguity is a big word and one that I find myself using very frequently these days. And this keynote will be no exception because holding ambiguity is a fundamental part of our role. And when I think about holding ambiguity, what I really think about is toy slime. You've probably had it or you have children or other little people in your life who have it. I honestly just bought some a couple of weeks ago, so there's also that. If you're not familiar with it, it's a really interesting, well, thing. Toy Slime has a really dif different texture from a lot of other things. It's not con no concrete shape. It can hardly be molded or broken into pieces. And it's constantly moving and kind of wobbly. So if you think of ambiguity throughout this talk, maybe keep that kind of texture in mind. And if you think about holding ambiguity in particular, because the reality is that change and ambiguity that comes with it, they aren't annoying side parts of what we do as leaders. Change is the work. Molding, driving, responding to change, initiating change, that's what we do. 
Sometimes when I interview candidates for jobs in my department, they ask me what I believe needs to change. And the one thing that I tell everyone is that I believe with every new person that joins our team, with any change in our code base, with any decision we make, we constantly shift, we adapt, evolve, grow, and we also need to respond to the changes that we're making. But there is more. Think about the changes that you're leading your teams through. You support teams in times like these. You grow teams and organizations. Many of you and my teams at least have embraced DevOps culture, which is fundamentally about change and reducing friction to increase our ability to change and change continuously. There's also the very big words like digital transformation, which is about fundamentally changing how we operate and deliver value to customers. Then there's startups, especially when you're in hyper growth mode. That's where change is your default. It's our state of being and operational mode. But also any engineering manager or tech leader, we're building the structures for the organization that we have at the same time while we're building the structures for the organization that we're looking to become. We change every day. And our job as leaders is to build environments, systems, teams that, where people can thrive and grow leaders that are able to create, drive, and be resilient to change. So that means that no matter if a change is desired or undesired, or if a change is desired with undesired side effects, there's a lot of combinations of that. And no matter if we're driving the change or responding to it, change requires that we show up as leaders. A year ago, I was invited to speak to our employee group for women and allies about navigating career changes. And I've had a few big changes in my career so far. I've moved across industries, roles, and levels many times. And through that, I've realized that I've had a few defining moments in my career that required me to show up, which led to huge changes after all. And I want to share two of those with you today. The first one was in early January 2014. I'd been consulting for some friends with research towards founding a company, a business setup, finances, those kinds of things. And we were walking back to the office after lunch, and one of my friends said, hey, I think you should become a co-founder and CEO. You've been doing all the work anyway. He wasn't wrong. And three months later, my co four co-founders and I sat in a notary's office. We signed papers and then took a group photo nearby. You might recognize the building in the background. It's the German Bundeskanzleramt or Federal Chancellery. The second moment was nine months later in September 2014. My co-founder called me and said he found a project for our newly founded bootstrap company. When he ran into this guy in the co-working space and that person said they really needed more engineers for this work that they're doing to support Ebola outbreak response teams in West Africa. But they're so overwhelmed with work and so sleep deprived that they don't have any time to bring on anyone to help. We decide to take on the project and shortly after I'm in Sierra Leone to work with some of our teams on site. These were the moments when I decided to take a leap into the unknown and show up. And in preparation for this talk, I've thought a lot about what it means to show up as a leader. I first started my brainstorming by thinking it might be somewhere along the lines of Meerkat style, where you pop up and then ideally you show up in cohorts only and then disappear again whenever you're done. But for anyone who's less on the actual nature and more in the fictional nature side of things you might also relate to ewok style where you kind of pop up out of nowhere in the bushes though or you might want to think of hiding somewhere behind a houseplant and then showing up from up there this actually kind of happened to me once um, in a meeting with a co-worker unintentionally um, if you ask me nicely sometime i may share a story with you i'll spare it to you today um but Peekaboo style isn't really an option either. But there is another thing that I've been thinking about much more. So I used to work, one of the many career changes I've had is that I used to work in catering in the restaurant and in hotel, um, basically hospitality industry and a few different parts of it. One thing that anyone who's worked there may know is that the basement there is usually a really special place. In the basement, you often have larger fridge rooms, which don't make it into the general areas. You have freezer rooms, equipment, storage, produce shelves. And it's usually very cold there um, because ideally you keep temperatures low to not have to spend so much electricity on the storage. It needs to be very clean and meet hygienic standards. But usually when you're down there, you're not really getting cold because you're moving, you're working. 
And in restaurants, it's usually one of the few places that's quiet. It's not really bustling unless, unlike the rest of the area, except someone occasionally pops in and drops something up and then runs out again. So it's a really nice spot to get work done and to focus on these tasks. And I thought back to that time when last week I listened to a podcast, the Dave Chang Show, which I can recommend. And Dave Chang is a restaurateur and TV producer, and he's been leading and running restaurants like the Momofuku chain in the US. And he and his co-host, Chris Ying, who's editor-in-chief of Lucky Peach magazine, they talked about new leaders who were running restaurants and who had never done anything like this. And basically, those chefs, they had to go with the flow. These, they had no idea what they were going to do. They were supposed to be leading a team and driving the creative side of the work. But suddenly they were in charge and had this impulse to hide in the, in the busy work. Suddenly the main place where you'd find those leaders would be in the basement doing inventory because that's where they felt in control. When was the last time that you wanted to hide in the basement and do inventory? I'll admit I've had that a few times in the last couple of months. So what I want to say with this is that I believe leadership strategies for 2021, because let's be honest, no one talks about 2020 anymore. I believe these leadership strategies have to be about how to not in the, hide in the basement and do inventory. And I want to break this down in three parts. First of all, leadership skills for this moment, then how to show up for yourself and how to show up for your team. Leadership skills to grow in yourself I believe the very first one that you need to keep in mind is growing, investing in the leaders around you and growing those. It's one of our biggest tasks as leaders. It means building a team that can learn, adapt and grow and stick together along the way. And it's our job to bring up people with and around us. So we need to identify aspiring leaders, people with high potential, delegate tasks to them to help them grow, give them stretch assignments and stretch goals. The leaders that I've seen growing the fastest in my career so far have usually been the leaders who delegate and bring up others around them. A really good other growth, growth mechanism can be helping people deal with higher degrees of ambiguity by giving them broader context, involving them in more in ambiguous discussions. The second fundamental leadership skill, I believe, is about our roles. It's really important that we focus on doing what needs to get done in service of our teams and business instead of, for example, our ego. I mentioned my work in hospitality and in order for guests to have a great time there, there's a lot of work going on that guests don't see, but when it doesn't get done, at some point it will show and also become a health hazard. I believe that our role as leaders is fundamentally about cleaning the dust off the shelves, sweeping the floors, evening out that wobbly table and cleaning the crumbs out of the toaster. We do this work not for our ego or for the shiny um, gratitude of people, but we do it in service of our company, our team, and of the product that we're building together. We do what needs to get done. And over all that, it's really important not to forget investing in our own learning and growth. In times of high change and uncertainty, it can be really easy to forget those things. But it's crucial to always keep learning and not just maintain our status quo. Always learn what makes leaders around you succeed or fail. It's your foundation for your own success as a leader. And you're here today, so you are here to learn, and I applaud you for that. You're doing great. So fundamental leadership skills, let's quickly recap. Leading through specifically focusing on growth on leaders and others as well, leadership and others, sorry, as well as in our own growth, and doing what needs to get done in service of our company, cleaning the crumbs out of the toaster. So now I want to talk a bit more about showing up for ourselves. And I usually make this a big focus of my talks about leadership because I do believe that in order to be good leaders, we need to put a lot of work into ourselves because there are formal paths into management, but the journey to being a good manager and especially a good leader is ultimately highly personal. First of all, we're looked at for answers. We're often the first person that people turn to, but most of all, we're constantly put into situations that we haven't been in before or to do things that we haven't done before. And we can train, read, learn, practice and role play. And those are all really important support structures and techniques. But in the end, so much depends on how we treat what's right in front of us, our own strengths, our thought patterns, our biases and our responses. 
So in order to be able to show up for others, we have to be able to show up for ourselves. First of all, I believe that means holding our values close. I've many times in my career asked myself, what kind of leader do I want to be? That's often been the case when I've been confronted with bigger disagreements and ultimately the question what I want to stand for and stand up for. So my values have evolved over time as the essence of questions I've faced and decisions that I've made. I believe in times of change, values are especially crucial. They're a great continuum and a guidepost. So hold your values close, be clear on what they are and why you have them. Manage your energy and your priorities. There's only so much time in the day and there's a lot of things that smart people have said on time management. I do wanna focus a bit more on energy. So identify in your day specifically by, for example, by looking at your calendar, what drains and energizes you? Why? What's with that one meeting on Monday that you hate and that never goes really well? How does that impact your energy levels? What mood do you go into the next meetings with? What energy do you have after that? Assess that and take, take notes during one or two, two sample days and then structure your workday to balance those. Because I believe that managing your energy level gives you much better sense of how to actually be effective in the conversations you're having. Because again, time is limited and the time management is a really other, really different kind of beast. Or if you need to do a dance break between meetings or listen to some good music or anything else that gets your energy levels up again. Showing up as a leader has a lot to do with the energy and the kind of the presence that we bring to the conversations we're in. And then, yeah, manage your priorities. Always be really clear on what the most important thing is that you could be focusing on. This is especially tricky in times of change because it can change really, really quickly. And priorities may shift and you may not know it or you may just not, yeah, may not know it. that's usually the main thing. So check in frequently and make sure that you know what your priorities are. And then avoid the operational comfort zone trap. The human brain is programmed to narrow its focus in the face of a threat. It's an evolutionary survival mechanism designed to protect us. And the trap is that our field of vision becomes restricted to the immediate foreground. I call this the operational comfort zone trap. It's pulling us to resort to what we know. And then we get in the weeds because we can. And this can get especially tricky if you've worked your way up through your organization because you're very good at the operational level. That's often why you got the promotion in the first place. And then managing a crisis directly can feel thrilling. Your adrenaline spikes, decisions are made, quick action is taken. And like all that weird ambiguity slime that you're holding in the rest of your job. So it feels like you're adding tangible value and there's instant gratification, which is great. This can be really hard to resist because you, after all, you know how to do the inventory, you know how to count the beans and you know how to do it well. But leading through change requires to take the long view instead of just focusing on managing the present. So you need to navigate different operational horizons, navigate between the present, the work that needs to be managed right now, as well as the near term, longer term, and then the big picture. Make sure that you, have, you either are managing the present or ideally you have, to have this delegated to someone and that you're constantly actively, actively working towards maintaining the longer view. Always make sure you know what's happening now, but also next week, next month, and think about the year ahead to prepare your organization and your teams. This is really hard and requires a lot of active work, but it can tremendously shift how you operate as a leader. The way I do this in practice is one of my recurring things that I just sit down at the start of my workday for 10 minutes to basically outline strategic views, strategic topics for my organization, make sure that I'm clear on those, but then also check in if my staff understand where we're going. This is really simple and really small, but I found it really effective. So showing up for ourselves, we hold our values close, we manage our energy and our priorities, and then expand our operational horizon. And now, of course, we can't talk about leadership without also talking about teams. They're really important. And the first one is we as leaders need to understand our team's needs and our organization's needs. I love this picture of an audio engineer trying to capture audio from a puffin. Um, this is for also relationships, which are especially important in times of change. Maintaining that connection to our teams is the basis for leading through change. Another important part there is leading through context. 
and then setting very clear expectations based on principles and outcomes. As a leader, you shouldn't be managing, like micromanaging people. I think it's been said many times. Instead, focus on direction, vision, make sure that people understand the bigger picture or the values that are driving you and your decisions and the organizations. And then focus on outcomes and task people with figuring out themselves how to get there. Of course, be there when they need you and make sure to check in on direction and that they're moving, trotting down the right path, but let them own things. This also really helps create a sense of ownership in organizations and it helps grow leaders around you again. Another crucial part of that is maintaining connection with the vision and purpose. Be relentless about communicating those and assume that people don't know them and will have to hear them many, many times. When you're tired of saying it, assume that about 60% of people have heard it. It's my rule of thumb and I haven't proven wrong yet. I haven't been proven wrong yet. This connection with goals keeps team members unified and it also adds meaning to what people do and it motivates. It also gives purpose and one easy way to do that is basically set yourself reminders. I personally operate very heavily driven by to-do lists, reminders, and my calendar. So reminders work for me, they might not work for you, but I set reminders. I also have a few recurring meetings that specifically revolve around strategy and then communicate those things whenever your reminder tells you to and check in with your team and make sure that they actually understand. And since we're on communication already, I want to talk a little bit about being a dolphin. Um, this is an example from David Feeney, Emeritus Professor of Information Management at Oxford. So dolphins can only take in very small amounts of air and as a result, they have to surface very frequently, about every 15 to 20 minutes. Whales though, whales can take in large amounts of air and therefore stay submerged for up to 90 minutes, depending on the whale type. So be a dolphin, communicate and communicate frequently. It's much better to pop your head up frequently to talk about a little change than only popping up every once in a while and then trying to get everything out. This also helps position you as a constant and a presence in your teams, which is really helpful again when a lot of change is going on or in the distributed team. Also use the same frequency for asking for feedback. So whenever you pop up, don't just communicate things out, make a PSA and then, sorry, public, public service announcement and then run away again. But also ask for feedback, check in with people. Also don't try to make a big splash at once in your communication and then hide. And also only sleep half with your brain, sleep with half your brain. Um, but this is the third point is probably proof that you shouldn't take everything that I'm taking you, that I'm telling you with, uh, at face value. So also last dolphin fun fact that I'm gonna share is that dolphins hear very high frequencies, 10 times the upper limit of adult humans. This was the end of the dolphin fandom part of this talk. I also do wanna talk once more about ambiguity. Um, one thing that I've had many conversations about this year is basically how to be empathetic with teams and make sure that you're understanding as a leader and acknowledging things that things, that things are difficult while also motivating people. I'm German and working with distributed teams over many years has taught me how much I live up to some cultural cliches. And unfortunately, those are not just limited to my love of bread and sparkling water, but they also involve that I sometimes don't get irony and I'm a pretty serious person. So I've over the years realized that I'm not a rah-rah type of manager and leader. And if I, I believe if I suddenly showed up all cheerful, people would be suspicious. But that said, I did bring a party hat for this talk. I'm just gonna have to attach this really quickly. It's probably gonna drop. But the reason I brought this party hat that I actually worked on over the last couple of days is that there's also a leadership trait I've been working on this year, which is realistic cheerleading. So not pandering to make people feel better, but helping teams develop self-awareness by being a realistic cheerleader for them. So sympathizing with the difficulties they're facing, but then also iterating that you believe that they have what it takes to turn their situation around. I've been actually working on this and specifically through creating more lightness in my interactions with my team, probably sharing the latest animal I found on TikTok or some other silliness. Sorry, I'm losing the party hat here. And it hasn't been much, this has been definitely much here, but it's been intentional and I've gotten feedback from my team that it's been a nice touch. So this kind of realistic cheerleading invites others to join your journey 
and it helps them understand what the journey is. It'll be a lift, but we can do it. Also, don't forget to celebrate wins, especially when things are tricky or difficult and a lot is changing. It can be easy to just gloss over those. Mark them as a team. Celebrate, even if it's just in a small way, or share gratitude notes, gratitude notes with people. So show up for your team by understanding what they need, leading through clear expectations, always communicating the vision, and then being a dolphin and a realistic cheerleader. And that's the last section that we've reviewed today. We talked about showing up as a leader in times of change by developing leadership skills, like leading through context and growing others around us and ourselves. We also talked about showing up for ourselves by using values for guidance, managing our energy well, and expanding our operational horizon. And of course, then showing up for our teams. So showing up as a leader is not about merkets, and it's ideally about not hiding in the basement, at least most of the time. I think everyone gets to hide in the basement every once in a while. But it's much more about cleaning the crumbs out of the toaster, holding the ambiguity and working through it with our teams, and being a dolphin. I believe that there's a lot of variables to what makes a good leader. Leadership isn't one action and then it's done and you're moving on. There are a lot of actions you can take and there are no heroes. Leadership is about always becoming a better leader for our team, leading with our team and being prepared as a team. And before I leave today, I want to leave you with one last notion on being prepared for change and unknown as a team. Blair Braverman, a musher, which is the human driver of a dog sled, she wrote about what my sled dogs taught me about planning for the unknown. She writes, and I quote, here's the thing about sled dogs. They never know how far they're going to run. Working with dogs in the wilderness means negotiating countless shifting variables. Snow and wind, wild animals, open water, broken equipment, each day's needs and changing mood. I learned that plans when I made them were nothing but a sketch. The only thing I needed to count on was that the dogs and I would make decisions along the way. What this means for people, for us, is that we can't just plan to take care of ourselves later. Because if you don't know how far you're going, you need to act like you're going forever. Planning for forever is essentially impossible, which can actually be freeing. It brings you back into the present. Change is the work. It's what we do. This year is a defining moment for all of us, and it is a defining moment for all of us as leaders. We are leading through change, all of us, and whether we want it or not. You may not know how far you're going and need to act like you're going forever, but planning for forever is essentially impossible. So in this defining moment, how will you show up as a leader? Thank you very much for having me and enjoy the conference.